I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Cook, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Center for Healthy Churches. This is the Changing Church webinar. It's designed to help ministers, congregations ask good questions about how to adapt what they're doing to carry out their mission in the 21st century. We're grateful for all the churches, my tag team of the Church Network, the Presbyterian Foundation, Tritt Seminary and the Tritt Church Network, Gardner-Webb, Divinity School, um, Baptist News Global, all of whom are organizations that do good work helping organizations, church-facing organizations do adaptive work. So for the last two weeks, we have been focused on a series in which we are asking, we're using history as a guide. Moments from the life of the church that were adaptive moments that have wisdom for us in this day and time. You have either the great pleasure or perhaps the unfortunate circumstance of being having two people who greatly love history who are your facilitators this morning. <laughs> Deb Wright and I both are people that rely upon the insights that we gain from history. We've both done um, graduate work in this area, and we rely on it. We think about it. We, we, we Both of us think in historical terms, not just the present moment, but also trying to put the present moment in a larger context. Um, and I, I don't want to speak for you, Deb, and you may want to add some stuff before we jump into the questions, but as a, as a, as a consultant, I often find myself not just asking, uh, asking what is a congregation's history, which we tend to think is very important. The DNA of a congregation through time has a shape, has an impact for its future, but also the church, not just a church, but the church. So both of us tend to value the lessons that we learn in that way. So, Deb, anything you want to add to that before we kind of jump in and get started in terms of how you are approaching this and how you thought about it the past couple of weeks or in general? Uh, I think I would like to add a bit if I could. Um, uh, so I am yep. this, uh, like uh, like Matt, this crazy church historian person. Uh, I have three degrees in religion. And of all the classes I've ever taken of, among those three degrees, my favorite is still one I took as an undergrad in the early 70s. I was an undergrad at Duke, and that was, uh, for some of you who might be of an age, remember that that was the big era of the Jesus movement, which had a huge impact on campuses. And what, um, what I, the re reason I bring this up is that I love very much the chat questions the last couple of weeks have been about how do I uh, how do I do applied church history in terms of what's going on today and what was going on then? Uh, in at the time of the Jesus movement, which was ancient back in the early seventies, um, uh, we had on campus a bazillion different Jesus groups that were proselytizing heavily, and some of them were very cultish, and some of them would get kids to persuade college kids to drop out of college, give all their money away. I mean, there were drastic forms of lifestyle that were uh, hitting the campuses. Um, so as a religion major, I asked uh, one of our professors if he would sponsor a, a seminar, if I could, you know, we'd see if there was any interest in it, um, on tracing the church uh, through church history, the roots of the theology of each of the groups that was running all over our campuses, recruiting kids. And so they, if you remember some of them, it was the, the way, the Jesus people, the um, uh, Jews for Jesus was there, the um, the uh, the, the children of God was there. There were all kinds of different groups. And we had, we filled up the seminar practically overnight. People were very anxious to this. And it got so popular. We each, you know, we, in pairs, we would delve into one group and chase the, the history on the Christian history tree to see where the roots of what they believed started and, and what scripture they were either um, uh, relying on or distorting in some cases of uh, the gospel and such. It was a fabulous course. Um, if we come back to today in that regard, I see two different aspects of distortions of gospel that are having a, a huge impact in our culture right now. And I think it could be helpful to us 
to look and see where they had where they took root earlier, where they have displayed themselves earlier, because uh, everything that goes around comes around um, in in the life of the church. And the the two that I would lay on the table for us to t- to look at today is um, one is the uh, existence and and strength of the prosperity gospel, and how prosperity gospel distorts the gospel. It to me the the theological underpinning of of its problem is that it turns the grace of God into a quid pro quo. Um, uh, If you believe in Jesus, you will be wealthy and you will be healthy. And I worked uh, in my training early on and and as a minister, I did some CPE work in a hospital and I was assigned to the ALS ward. That's the Lou Gehrig's disease ward. And I had a patient there whose uh, father had died of ALS, whose twin daughter, twin sister had died of ALS. And she was in the process of dying of ALS. And I went in to see, I'd, I'd gotten to know her pretty well. She didn't talk. We developed, you know, way on an alphabet chart. This was before computers. I'm that old. Um, and uh, to, to speak, so to, so to speak. And um, when I walked in that this particular day to see her, there was um, a pastor there who was urging her on that and telling her that message of uh, you are only sick because you have not confessed a particular sin. Now, what is it? And let's confess it and let's make you well. And this is a woman who couldn't move. She could only move one thumb. That's the only part of her body she could move. But I could see the fear in her eyes and the tears pouring down her cheeks. And the pastor was reading it as, oh, you're so pleased to get this release. And I was reading it as get the hell out of here. Um, And so I overstepped my bounds and told him to get the hell out of here to a, a fellow pastor. Um, I was livid. But it that's the dark side of prosperity gospel. It's that other side of like, if you're not rich and you're not healthy and not beautiful and all, not all these wonderful things, it's, it's because of this quid pro quo with God. And that just goes against our understanding of grace. And oh, by the way, Jesus was born poor and died poor and hung out with the poor. Um, uh, yes, possibly a white magic, I would say, Mike. Um, The second one I'd like to put on the table and talk about how it influences us today in our churches, in addition to that one, is uh, the the growth of Christian nationalism, which is scary. Um, uh, I grew up in the pre-civil rights South, so I experienced um, the the anger of civil rights movement and and its uh, backlash there. I know some of you are probably in that situation too. Um, Yesterday, I saw uh, on the news, I was watching Alex Wagner on MSNBC, and she had a, a long, in-depth interview with a relatively new public school teacher in Florida, who had been taken to an, a, as she called it, um, it was it was training uh, supposedly for new new teachers, and and what it, they showed it, it was an indoctrination course that DeSantis's people had put together, that was filled with images of Christian nationalism in terms of teaching in the public school. As you know, in Florida, I, I don't know if we have anyone here on the call who's in Florida. I grew up there. Um, the, I mean, they banned so many books, they banned words to use, they banned topics, things like that. And this was a, really sort of a, a, an indoctrination about what you can and can't do. And it's all because, you know, our original founding fathers wanted us to be a Christian nation. It was founded on that fallacy. But when we look at the distortion of the gospel around that too, um, it, and we see, we can see that it has a, an, a growing influence on both our congregations and those who stay away from church for reasons because of it. So I wanted to lay that on the table as sort of the thread of history. Um, and and for me, I mean, I did my my uh, research in heresy forms orthodoxy. It's it's when you, you know, when heresy gets out too far, it's kind of like that Supreme Court judge who said, I don't know how to define pornography, but I know it when I see it. It's like heresy is like, oh, no, now we've crossed a line somewhere. Let's talk about that and let's form a them and us about it. So um, I, I think it has a huge influence uh, now. Yeah, the way that I, the way that I, the, the best definition of heresy that I heard is you take something good and you so stress it to the level that it warps everything that's connected to it. So you take the divinity. That's a good, of Jesus. That's a good image. And you take the divinity of Jesus too far. You take the humanity of Jesus and you take the humanity of Jesus too far. And Baptist circles, I would say the authority of scripture. We take, we, we, we take that and we turn it into, you know, the, an inspiration that doesn't leave room for any kind of human agency in some ways. And now 
certain politicians are actually extending to certain documents. You know, the Constitution is the Texas Constitution is divinely inspired in the same way the Bible is. So that's that's the that's the best definition of heresy I've heard. And Deb, I'm gonna I'm gonna call an audible here a little bit based on some of the things that you just said. So 16th century on the continent, 17th century in England were both moments where you look back at them and there was a lot of of uh, move, movements that we look back on now and we kind of look down our noses at them and we would even say some of those movements were heretical um, they were crazy they were radical they took they took their religious beefs and they took them to such extremes in some cases of course the winners always write the you know always write the history so we we say they're extreme now but in that day and time some of the people that that are the winners you know um, the Anabaptists and the Baptists have calmed down, but in, but back in those days, they were considered radicals and extreme. So a lot of that happened on the continent in the 16th century. A lot of that happened in England in the 17th century. So are we in a moment like that now? Are we in a moment where because post-modernity has kind of, as it's been like a fruit basket turnover in which so many of the things that were stable in American religion are no longer stable. And there's just a lot of energy. And some of that energy is going to take the take some really squirrely forms, maybe the reassertion of the prosperity gospel in some ways, maybe Christian nationalism. You could make a case for that. Um, or what do you think? Or, or is that is what's happening in, in some of these more pernicious things that you that you were pointing to? Are those just one-offs in your mind? What would you say? Well, I'd say in terms of Christian nationalism, it's never disappeared. It's always right. been somewhere. Um, and I think that uh, I, 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 do, I do sort of have this, this vision of um, the stretching that you just get, the, you know, the stress of, of heresy, of that we've gone through periods of, of um, putting stress on what church is. I, to me, one of the stressors right now we have in American Protestantism is that, and we're just sort of waking up to that in our work, is that um, uh, we have way too many churches that are living as though Christendom is alive and well. And they don't get that it isn't. And they don't get that it's not their fault, uh, that, uh, what they're going through. So I think that we're adapting um, by reactive behavior in many of those situations. And that calls for experimentation. So yes, you're going to get experimentations at the edges. That to me is how heresy has always worked. It's the work at the edges that then, you know, flies off into some uh, exaggeration of a piece of gospel taken out of context, usually. Um, and so I, th I think that, that this is all sort of a natural piece of that. Um, and, I, and maybe, the, you know, we go into our churches encouraging them to experiment at this phase, you know, encouraging them to use their holy imagination about how they can see themselves becoming a church in a post-Christendom era that's healthier. Um, and experimentation, you know, creates chaos. So there it is. Yeah. And Glenn, there's of course, no I remember way. you can't. Yeah, there's go no ahead. way to get for there to be energy, for there not to be excess energy. There's no way for there to be creativity for, I mean, you know, in the business world, they expect certain, they expect a certain number of their experiments to fail, you know, mm -hmm. to realize in retrospect, this isn't exactly what was best for us organizationally. You know, we, we've, we, right now, what I think is happening is American Christianity is always hardest to consider change on the heels of great success. And historically speaking, um, the first 200 years of American Christianity since the founding of the Republic, by and large, you know, give or take a few years, was enormously successful. Yeah. Enormously successful. And we're still looking backwards to what the lessons that success taught us of the last 200 years, rather than recognizing we've probably- exactly gone as far as those that that kind of success is going to take us 
And now we're back into an adaptive moment. Yeah. I had a professor put it to me one way. He said, it, if you look at the historical swings, of, like you're saying, and especially sort of after success, you know, what is next when yeah. it starts to crumble. Um, uh, he used the analogy of if you really go back to the sacrament and said, is baptism in your era rising or dying? You know, is it the going down into the water or the coming back up that you're going through? And it, it because we are the death and resurrection people. And I yep. think we are always on those swings. I, I also think that we're at, a, we're at a time when the safe place to run is not, not the center. It used to be for a long time. The safe place to run was the center. Now, the place that feel people feel safest is at the, the polarized edges yeah. with their own yeah. tribe you know, and there's reinforcement in the culture to do that. So I'm interested, Deb, in, so, you know, for the last two weeks, I've been kind of pulling some moments from history that I think have adaptive lessons for us in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in you from, from your own experience, like what's, what's, if when you reach back into history and you reach back for moments that you have lessons to teach us, teach the 21st century church, especially in your context, a West Mm -hmm. Coast context where Christendom, you know, gave up the ghost a lot sooner than those of us in Texas. So when you reach back into history for some, for, for some moments or some periods or some lessons that you think are life-giving, what do you reach, what are you reaching back for? Um, That's a good question. Both Jim Kitchens and I, in, in our new matrix work, realized that we, both were transplants to the West Coast out of the South, out of the Bible Belt and Bible Belt upbringings. Um, and it was it was culture shock to come to Berkeley or to San Francisco in that situation where we were already, we were ordained into post-Christendom. So we right. never served churches here that weren't already in that situation where we weren't all already a minority culture out here. Um, those of us who were church. What it has helped for me to go back in now is to, um, and I'm working a lot at, at the moment, I, half the work I'm doing is with um, churches that have uh, less than full-time clergy. We're working on that sort of part-timeness of ministry and, and how to, to thrive in that, um, is that one of the most important things is to say, um, you guys are the norm. You've always been the norm. If you look at the larger picture, you don't feel like the norm in the post-World War or two era of church, but you were the norm in the 2000 yearsness of church that most churches didn't have full-time educated clergy. Um, and what were their models? So that's a very important adaptive thing that we look at um, uh, really deeply. Um, and the notion of uh, going back, you know, say, oh, well, we need to go back to the first century. I always say, no, let's go back to the third. Let's not go back to the first century of the undergroundness of, you know, the, the earliest apostles and, and whatnot. Let's go to just before we institutionalized it under Constantine. And let's look at what the church was before it owned property and before it was allowed to accumulate wealth and, and pick up some threads there of how to be church that could inform us. Not that I'm saying sell all your buildings right now. And although I'm working with churches that are being buildingless churches now um, and, you know, and find the threads of how community and church worked then and um, bring them forward. I also think that uh, the two issues that I brought up today um, of the comparisons of sort of the old heresies rerouting and, 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 and re-blossoming currently um, it, to me, it's it's critical because it's um, it, it, when, when I work with churches, I explain sort of what the nuns and the duns are. I'm sure that's language you guys know. The nuns are the people who check the none of the above in terms of religious affiliation. We call the duns the people who used to be churched and then de-churched um, themselves for whatever number of reasons and saying if those people, their version of in their mind of what church is, is a negative version. So if they're looking for authenticity or belonging in their lives, it doesn't occur to them that you would find that in a church. Um, It occurs to them that churches are those white Christian nationalists, maybe. Or it occurs to them that it's those crazy prosperity gospels who think they need a second layer jet to minister. Um, and, And so they don't have a vision in their mind or an experience in their mind, especially a couple of the younger generations who've never been to church, don't have a vision of what church can be that is other than those headlines. Um, so that to me is an important piece of, of connectivity. Yeah. I, so, um, I, 
I taught a doctoral seminar not terribly long ago where we were where we were reading um, 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 Jones's book um, on uh, Christian social innovation and how the his, how the church has walked away from Christian social innovation that for so long a part of the upside of the church being so strong in American culture is we were building things and so much of what we were building was life giving into the culture. We were building universities and we were building hospitals and we were building nonprofits that were doing great work. And on the local level, churches are still doing some of that nonprofit work, but on, on the larger institutional level, we haven't created anything that was life giving on a large scale in a long time, which then leaves the story to be all right, really all the church is about is preserving the status quo that benefits us uh, exactly. if we're not careful. And that's that's a really, really important shift that's taken place recently. Um, now, having said that, I also think we're entering into a moment, um, an awareness of the missional nature of the church, kind of a, a, a returning to that. I'd like to think that we are at the beginning stages of this kind of this understanding of the church on mission, the church is mission, that maybe that's going to add, that's going to create some ferment, which which, which becomes creative in some ways. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested, though, in asking you um, actually two questions, like a, a negative question and a, and a positive question. Let me start with the negative. It's in, in some ways, it's the opposite sides of the same coin. The negative question is, what are the things what are the challenges do you see specifically for the American church? Like, what are the, what are our stumbling blocks in, in, in American Christianity to fostering a, a adaptation and renewal in the life of the church that are particular to American Christianity? Start there. Um, okay. I, you know, your field of revivalism um, uh, sort of influences this answer is that we were in a big period of building constant and you talk about building right. universities and hospitals also building churches and right. um and we are overbuilt now in churches and and so you know we hit that wall of okay got that check that one off now what do we do right. um i think that that is uh, you know staring us in the face i think that the the notion of um uh of mission. I want to go back to what you said about being missional, because I think we're facing a period where an old style of mission in an old meaning in my lifetime old, um, which isn't that it was getting older all the time, but that, you know, mission was for many of our churches cutting our checks to Africa and South America, you know, to whatever mission was going. We send missionaries. We do think we do great work. You look at American Protestantism today and by and large, the growth in American Protestantism, this is certainly true in our denomination, is immigrant churches planting themselves here. The people that we missioned over in Africa and South America now are, are setting up uh, immigrant churches in, within our denomination here. And, and so the notion of cutting the check is mission is shifting, thank God, you know, and getting deeper. And when we say in your own backyard, we're suddenly finding the Ethiopian church next door which, you know, which got uh, sort of uh, built, evangelized in, on our checks that we're sending. So how do we retranslate that? How do we see ourselves as other than dominant um, uh, white Protestant culture? Um, and, and even sort of the, the you know, the, the design of, of how we understand churches shifting. I think I've told you all before that uh, when I worked with small churches and I was working in North Carolina and I was working with a, a, a probably 20, 30 churches in North Carolina. And um, there was a cluster of four or five uh, black churches in one area that I was working with. And, the, and we would talk about bivocational ministry being sort of a, um, a, a, a movement that we're going towards. And they would laugh at me in the tenderheartedest way and said, I don't know a black preacher that doesn't have three jobs. Um, and that notion of our limited sort of blinders view of what the church is, um, it is something that is ahistoric. You know, we, we have frozen ourselves in a very narrow time and don't recognize that often. So I think that's one of the, the big negatives. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I've always found it ironic. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not hating on St. Peter's Basilica in, in Vatican City. If you've ever been to it, it's beautiful. Yes, I have. Majestic. 
it is holy. I mean, there's there's so much about it that is good, but I've always found it ironic that they started building the kind of quintessential symbol of the church's institutional significance in 1506. And just a few years later, along comes the Protestant Reformation. So it, it, it you know, the church kind of reached at the same time the church was kind of reaching the height of its institutional, its property power in the late medieval era was co coincided almost at the exact same moment with a, with, a, with a protest movement that turned into a reform movement that turned into a renewal movement. And I think that says something to us, right? It does. It does. To me, it was that I, an, an image that I have used that has flaws but it's helpful is if you have fort knox versus crypto and the vatican went with the fort knox right before yeah. crypto broke um in the reformation and and it's sort of like rewriting all the rules i live in an environment that made its wealth and is famous for breaking all the rules we have every disruptive corporation you can think of you know all our logos are airbnb and lyft and uber all of on all our, our skyscrapers and and it's that notion of coming in and breaking some old rule um and yet you know if we apply that to church breaking rules for the grace of god is sort of part of what our reformed and always being reformed is about and I, you know i speak as a presbyterian louder than that i i think of one of the most powerful ones now of, of speaking to Christian nationalism is going back to, you know, and I, I, I confess we, we Presbyterians are big on our confessional statements, but uh, one of our collection that we, that we revere very highly is the Barman Declaration. You know, Bart and Bonhoeffer getting together with the, the gang and writing this profound short declaration in, actually it was, this, it was written in 34. So it was well before Hitler, you know, had gotten on to 37, 38, 39. And yeah. it was sort of, I see this coming. I see this coming through what Hitler's doing with the church because, he, you know, Hitler knew he needed the church and the Boy Scouts on his side and then he'd make it. Um, and that's what he got. And it, it, the Barman Declaration ha follows that pattern, that biblical pattern of, um, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. It's that rhythmic pattern of this versus this. So in that sense, it's heresy and orthodoxy, you know, sort of to the max. But it it in that time said, you know, you you hear it, you know, the, the, we reject the false doctrine of was the phrasing that they used up six times in Barman. But we say to you, the church is this, Jesus Christ is this. And I think we're coming. I, I mean, I, I smell it in the air that we're coming to some increased political violence related to religion. And I don't know where and how it's going to erupt. I mean, you know, the, the fearful part of me says, and they've got all the guns. You know, yeah. It is that sense of, of uh, how is it going to erupt? And, how, and are we going to be called on at a larger level, not just a local level, although it's going to play out in the local level, you know, in terms of violence in a church service or whatever, of how do we come to the point of saying, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, are we being pushed to that point now? Yeah, I think we are. And I, and, and to, so we've got that parallel in the 20th century on the continent. We also have, so you have the, the Protestant Reformation um, sparks the Counter Reformation. Mm -hmm. And so you have this, you know, this, this resistance movement that wants to resist all of what's emerging yeah. um, from Luther and Calvin. And so the interesting aspect of that is, that, not everything that happened in the Counter Reformation, from uh, from the perspective of renewal of the church, is a bad thing. Some new monastic movements ar arose yeah. out of that that continue to be life giving. But by and large, in the moment, what it led to was violence on the European continent. It led to the Hundred Years' War that that we couldn't figure out ways to deal with the fact that that, that there was a call for reform. Reform was going to be resisted. I can make a really good case that Christian nationalism is the 21st century version of the Counter-Reformation. And um, so, you know, it, the, the, the challenge that we face, that we've always faced, the church has always faced is when the church acquires power uh, or when the church becomes associated with power, the church doesn't give that power up easily and more oftentimes resists the loss of that power than it does the, the lessons that come from humility 
and kind mm-hmm. of returning to kind of the, the essential truths of the faith, the essential truths of the gospel, you know, rather than preserving what has been created in some ways that is institutionally impressive in a lot of ways. So, well, and that's where I, I always go back to one of my most loved metaphors from one of my most loved historian, church historians, Phyllis Tickle. And we lost her a couple of years ago, but her famous um, just sort of Appalachian version of just saying, you know, it just all boils down to every 500 years, Christianity throws a, rum- a rummage sale and, and redoes, you know, how it's going to be and how it's going to do church. And I, I work with my local church and saying, what is your rummage sale in your church that we're going through? What are the things that we need to do the sorting of quit doing this? You know, if it's that spaghetti dinner that you had to pull people's hair out to volunteer for, it's not really producing much anymore, you know, put it in the rummage sale. If it, what are the other things that we need to sell? And then because once you clear that, anyone knows once you've cleared your closet, then you want to go get new clothes. Um, and it's that it's that version of um, watching the emerging of the rummage sale over and over again um, that I that I think we're facing. You know, we're we're at that period, too. We're in that 10 year period of flux of the 500 mark. Um, uh, of saying, okay, what is our rummage sale going to look like? I think that the notion of the Hundred Year War, it, I mean, I, it, we may sound like alarmists here on a Thursday morning um, in America, sort of saying, you know, violence is coming. Violence is there. Um, anger is there. Yeah. And it's a righteous anger among so many of the people who hold the anger, the very righteous anger. And um, that's where we're going to see sort of are the crusaders, if you will, um, going to have, you know, the typical sort of uh, America wrapped in a, a, a flag and carrying a Bible. Um, and, and how do we respond to that? All right. So let's not go full 100 percent doom and gloom. Let's go a little bit of hope. Okay. Right. As well. So I asked you the question about what do you the see negative. in American Christianity that is an obstacle so let me ask you, where are you seeing hope? Like, what are, ah. what are the, the, the green shoots coming up through the soil that maybe offer some promise that you see from your, from your perspective? Okay, so I, I live in the land of St. Francis in San Francisco, and I see two things uh, uh, that I would call. One is, when I first got here, I, you know, it was an era where people were leaving the Christianity they'd grown up with and seeking truth in Eastern religions, you know, nothing to say, I'm not saying it's being against Eastern religions, but what they were looking for was the contemplative version of faith. And my answer was always shame on us Christians that we lost that thread. You're talking about, you know, the monastic uh, side that came up during the same time there was the, the violence going on. It's that sense of we, we didn't teach you know, contemplative faith. So we, I was part of the group that put it in the first big labyrinth at Grace Cathedral and opened up the whole sort of labyrinth in America movement in the 80s and early 90s. They, um, so that notion of understanding the threads of our faith that got lost in the in translation somewhere is one of them. The other one, um, I would say, is the 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 notion of St. Francis as one who was connected to the land and to nature. And so the spiritual nature of environmentalism is very big where I live. That, you know, environmental um, uh, spirituality is a big practice where I am in churches. And um, I see that as a wonderful, it's often put in terms of social justice and environmentalism, but it's also an understanding of God's earth and being stewards and expanding that sense of stewardship um, that is, is literally rooted in the earth and and how it grows in that is is something that i think is a a challenge that we're on the cusp of and that may be west coast wave that hadn't hadn't hit the east coast yet i don't know but it's um it's certainly very big and and very encouraging it's yeah, drawing we, people back to church too those of us who don't live in california often poke fun at all the crazy things that happen in california and then often find ourselves 20 years later doing the it, very until the wave hits you. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. that happens. And, and it's always a bit of a judgment call to know which of those two it's going to be. So be careful right. what you criticize, because you may be you may be adapting in that direction 20 years down the road. That's right. I, I, Deb, here's what here he, we, we're moving kind of from history to prognostication in some ways with this next question. But here's here's what I find myself struggling with a little bit, like, or struggling is maybe the wrong way to frame. Here's what I find myself turning over in my head. We are certainly in the midst of a significant adaptive moment for the American church. Like that, that like 
there is no place in American Christianity that I see really with the, I mean, Christian nationalism, I guess you could make a case is a, is that we got to hold on to the status quo kind of mo moment. But even in, even in more conservative evangelical circles, not just evangelical as a whole, conservative evangelical circles, I still hear the, the, the dial is set more towards we have more change work to do than we have preservation work to do. But mm. what, I try, what I'm trying to figure out in my head is, is this the beginning of a moment in which really it's going to be creative and there really are going to be some interesting things that emerge that, that historically become life-giving for not just the church in America, but the church you know, capital C global church, but, but that are happening here in America, or I can also make a pretty good case that the energy of the church moves from one place to another place that you, you know, in certain places in time, it was in, it was in West Asia and certain places in time, it was in Europe and certain, or in, on the continent of Europe and certain places in time, it was in England. It's been in America for it was in America for the better part of 150 years, I could make a really good case that the energy, the creative energy in the church is in Africa and East Asia now, or Central okay. Asia now. So I guess here's, here's, a, here's a question I'd be interested in seeing. Like, just if, if, if I had to, if we went to Vegas and placed a bet on this, Deb, you and I together, we went to Vegas and bet on this. Is this going to be a highly creative moment for the American church, or is this going to be a moment where the best thing that we can do is humble ourselves and pay close attention to what our Asian brothers and sisters and our African brothers and sisters have to teach us and let that pour back in and renew the church? What do you think? Well, I play Vegas, so I'll play. The, um, <laughs> I, th I think I think it's, it's the experimentation. It's, it's the you know, I, it's it's that era of constantly seeking where you can hear the and see and feel the wind of the Holy Spirit moving and that it may be moving in swirls. And we need to sort of find that out. I, I also think that we're that the evolution, the, the, I won't say the evolution, the display of those changes in America right now style usually leads over substance so you recognize this the style play it's like oh well if we all move to praise bands that'll do the trick you know or, or whatever the thing of the of the decade is um if we all get a labyrinth that'll do the trick that's sort of the you know differential there um is that we we haven't um we haven't hammered out we're in the process of the lines being blurred and maybe headed towards being erased of denominationalism. Um, and so it's going to be the sort of mainline thought versus evangelical thought. And I grew up in the evangelical thought area and then, then moved, but it's that sense of, um, you know, where, how do we, how do we understand the root of the gospel in it? And I, I think the way you move from style to substance is you can get back to, Jesus, you go, you know, you forget church and you get back to Jesus and, and forget worrying about the style of church, the, the, the form of church, the structure of church yeah. and get back to message. And I think that's where it'll flourish one way or the other. I, I, my hunch is that the, that the people who are the forerunners of the, of the next great life-giving season in the church my hunch are we don't know their names because they're they they're not in the united states and they're oh, already that's true and and only from the perspective of history are we going to look back and know that this person and this church and this place and this movement taught us a lesson that we absolutely needed that's a, that that's that's I, I i if i knew who those people were i would point everybody to them so it's nothing other than a hunch. I don't have anything to say other than to say, I think the church has always been, the church is always at its best where it's most cruciform. Like mm -hmm. if, if we are humble and sacrificial, um, the power, the spiritual power that emerges when the church takes seriously 
um, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and not just in historical terms, but in methodological terms, I, 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 I would point to that. And I, I, I think I, I, this is my way of answering the question I asked you earlier. I think we have a, we're, we're pretty privileged. The American church is fairly privileged. We're propertied. We're, we're wealthy. And, and historically speaking, you know, the church tends to do better when it's lean, right? Yeah. Um, and mobile um, and not, and not scrappy. You know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's nothing other than a hunch. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I put this in the chat. I, I don't know if anybody else has any questions that they want to, that they want to, that, that, that you'd love for, for Deb, Deb and I to weigh in on. Mike Parnell asked the question and I'll give voice to it. Isn't it always the preacher's responsibility to kind of interpret the moment and speak to the moment? And my, that is absolutely true. Like the, and, and I, that's part of why we offered this series over the last few weeks is we, Deb and I both think that um, while history doesn't repeat itself, that it does rhyme and that, and that helps ministers, that helps pastors um, figure out, okay, the church has been in similar moments before and the way that when the church responded in this way, it led to life. And when the church responded in this way, it led to death. And I think individual ministers have that same responsibility now to help our con- the people in our congregations interpret these times too. So it, 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 part of the being privileged and comfortable is sometimes we don't point out what needs pointing out, you know, the Christian nationalism question, um, especially in purple churches where people are trying to avoid political conflict because there's so much conflict. There's so much anger out there that wouldn't it be great? The church is a place of peace and refuge and the church should be a peace place of peace and refuge, but maybe that's a false peace. Um, that's going to lead to an even greater conflict down the road. So I do think we have a responsibility to name what we see in this moment. So Deb, what were you well, going to say? It, well, it's got two things. I mean, that last piece you said, it's like that old sort of part of our role is uh, comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable. And yeah. are we are we leaving one for the other there? Uh, to Mike's question, what jumped off me was that, because, you know, I'm a party in it at some level, is that um, hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Yeah. The problem is, that in our different uh, settings, even our different t- congregations, what newspaper you're holding in that hand, or more of a point, what cable version of news yeah. are you holding in that other hand? They disagree on what the facts of the world are, yeah. and and they tell different sets of, of reality, and that's a tough one uh, for us to to deal with. To me, it's the it's the um, that we've lost that sort of foundation of, of a similar sense of what reality and truth is that and that it's really why, hard to hit that's why bart is probably helpful in this moment it 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 um i've been doing a lot of work in romans because of some you know the work that we're doing mm-hmm. on the romans 12 project um and and i've gone back to bart's reading of romans and luther's reading of romans and augustine's reading of romans and I, the reason why i think some of the most significant historical figures keep going back to that is because that book at its deepest level, I think is a book about is, is a Christological treatise. Like that's what it is. Like, and I, and I think in big moments where the church is out in the wilderness, trying to find its way, that's what we've got to go back to. Um, So anyway, well, that's why I think, the work that you guys are doing that we're all working on on the Romans 12 is such a um, uh, the right direction. I don't know if folks know about that or if it's if they're supposed to yet, but it's 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 a coming. <laughs> yeah, for those it, it, we're, for those who are who are listening in about Romans 12, uh, CHC and New Matrix are, are both in, in, in various ways. I mean, kind of collectively, we, we, we work together as one organization now we're working on a project to help churches deal with cultural and political polarization. And and the way that I think you do that is not by trying to just say, can't we all just hold hands and get along? You have to have something beneath your unity or it's a false unity. And beneath our unity, I think is our, our common commitment to bearing our crosses. And I think that's, that's what that's ultimately about. So with that said, thank you for joining us once again for this trip down history lane. We're going to go one more week in this. 
Next week, Doug Weaver, the chair of the Department of Religion at Baylor University, and also a world-class church historian is going to be with us to close out our series. Hope you'll join us next week. Thanks, everybody.